Yep. Yes. And the pointer, yes. Uh, yes. I always use this one instead of the laser pointer because the laser pointer seems slower usually. Yeah. Uh, good. Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, of course, it would probably be a more of a pleasure to be in Byron Bay talking to you all in person, but uh, uh, it's great to have actually these talks throughout the day. I spent my evening listening to them while working on my lecture last night, and that was a lot of fun. So thanks to the organizers for uh, having me uh, included in this talk, and I've greatly enjoyed what I've seen so far. So um, the aim of today's talk then uh, is indeed, and I see I've missed a space in the title, uh, it's to tell you about recent work we've been doing in the lab with our trapped ion system uh, on uh, error correction of a logical GKP qubit by autonomous uh, dissipation. So the way we got into this game was we uh, were playing with squeeze states essentially, and uh, one of our key techniques is what have been called conditional displacements last night in a few uh, talks. And uh, we realized then in 2018, I was sitting in a talk of Barbara's actually, and uh, I realized that this set of techniques was nice for preparing GKP uh, states. Uh, and so then in a paper back in 2019 with Christoph Luhmann, then we demonstrated that we could create uh, GKP states and perform universal control essentially on these states. Uh, and at the time I had no real uh, idea how we could do uh, quantum error correction. Uh, and so today I'm happy then that we've been able to resolve that in part inspired by the beautiful work from Yale uh, um, by Philippe and, um, and Michel Devere's group. Uh, and uh, that's allowed us now to see how to do quantum error correction, and that's the results that I want to uh, present to you today. So uh, first, I should just thank our sponsors, I think primarily the Swiss uh, National Science Foundation for this particular track of work. So our experimental system, I think you haven't seen too many times in this workshop, is uh, trapped ions, and in fact, the particular trap that we're using uh, in the work that I'll describe today is uh, looks like this. It's a bunch of alumina wafers coated in gold and we apply voltages to them and we can then trap strings of individual ions. These are calcium ions sitting in that uh, trap. Now this trap was de designed for dealing with lots of ions to do quantum computing experiments with many qubits. Yeah? But we've found a lot of joy just working with uh, a single ion essentially uh, and making use of exploring larger Hilbert spaces through, uh, as we've seen in this uh, workshop, uh, the oscillator space. And we've had a lot of uh, fun with that up till now. But uh, let me describe then the two degrees of freedom that we're using when we're controlling uh, ions. Uh, the first of those is that uh, these are individual atoms, right? So they have electronic uh, internal states, which are the ones that you learned about in uh, an atomic physics course in the hydrogen atom and so. Uh, and the lowest lying states of the calcium ion that I'm going to use in the work in this talk uh, can be seen here. So there's a ground state which essentially is infinitely uh, long lived. Uh, and the excited state, and I'm going to call these two spin states, despite the fact that this gap is uh, 400 terahertz and it's not really a spin, uh, but the upper state has a 1.2 second uh, decay time. So that means we've really got a very good T1 uh, time, at least on that state. And we manipulate the internal states of these ions by tuning a, a laser at 729 nanometers to being near resonant with the transition between these two levels. Now, on top of that, there are additional levels. Uh, and what you'll see there is that these have to be short-lived. Uh, and these are useful because they provide us with a fast channel to extract information from the ion. So actually, when you see a picture of an atom like this and it's shining, that's fluorescence that's due to exciting this transition here and due to the decays out of this short-lived level. And we collect that fluorescence over a reasonable amount of time. So that's the atom in its internal states, if you like, and I'll come back to that a little bit more in, uh, in some more details. But the other thing that this atom can do is it's in a trap. So it's located at a particular point in space, but it of course oscillates about that point in space, right? So the two degrees of freedom, if you like, and the, for the purposes of this talk, the oscillator is really the thing we're using as a quantum object and trying to control. And the electronic states are our access to that oscillator, uh, which we use to perform the control. And the classical field that we use is the laser field uh, of the uh, laser. Okay, so um, the as I said, the internal states, our spin system, if you like, is separated by some 400 terahertz or so. 
uh, and the oscillator is at around two megahertz. So you'll see that there's some a very large difference in time scales uh, between the two, if you like, but they're also uncoupled uh, if they're just sitting there in the in the lab. So to couple them, that's where the laser comes in, right? It couples to internal states because it can couple to the internal quadrupole moment actually of the atom. Yeah. And it couples the motion to the internal states because laser beams carry momentum and so can import, uh, um, impart forces uh, on the atom. Yeah. So that's the thing that couples these two. And as a result, then if we scan the frequency of our laser over this internal state transition, then we don't just see a, a transition at the spin flip frequency, if you like, but we rather also see modulation sidebands from the fact that an oscillating ion in a laser field modulates the phase of the laser uh, field. Yeah? And if we tune our laser to any one of these sidebands, then we basically get a different Hamiltonian that we can pick. Yeah? Uh, so if I tune uh, to just flip the spin, well, I get a, just a spin flip, Bravi oscillation on the spin flip transition. If I go down to one of these motional sidebands, then I find I can pick up either a Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian, uh, or if I go to another motional sideband, then uh, I can pick up an anti Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian. Yeah. And all of that's done with a single frequency in the laser, i.e. I can go here and then I just pick out that one Hamiltonian. And what I'm going to use in this talk primarily is that we don't drive with a single frequency laser, but we uh, drive with a laser that simultaneously has frequency components here and here. And if I do that, then there's a phase factor between those two components, but basically I can start to sum these Hamiltonians together to create other Hamiltonians that might be of interest. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to the physics of the uh, trapped ion system. What we want to apply that to is error correction. Uh, and of course, uh, I think this has been introduced many times. So the, the type of code that I'm going to tell you about today is, is a bosonic code, right? So it uses this large Hilbert space of the oscillator to redundantly store a qubit. Uh, of course, that's a sort of counter to these many qubit codes, right? Uh, and in fact, our setup was built to try and start to examine many qubit codes, and we have done any experiments in those areas. But these are very daunting because in order to uh, implement them, then uh, even to start implementing, then you have to typically uh, have control of 10 or so individual quantum systems, and that's challenging, right? So the access somehow to a single logical qubit uh, in these oscillators is easier. But as you saw in Barbara's talk, we shouldn't be uh, you know, afraid of the notion that in the ultimately, in order to produce any sort of quantum computer, we need to concatenate probably these codes uh, into these types of codes. So a quantum computer is still an astonishingly difficult thing to make, even if we can perform error correction on a logical qubit here, even though it's very nice, of course, to be able to explore error correction in this area. So the particular code that we've been dealing with is this uh, GKP code, uh, which I think you all know about. So. Uh, let me briefly sketch it. The, the principal component somehow is the notion that displacement operators, so these are operators on either position or momentum in this case, uh, with some amplitude alpha or beta don't commute, but when you swap their order, they pick up a phase factor. Yeah. But the key thing is that I can choose the amount of displacement I use, alpha or beta, and I see that the phase factor is given by the product of the two, right? So this is where this grid arrives because we, what we're trying to do is to fix the product of these two components, right? So if I look at logical operators, then what I'm trying to do is to produce two operators that anti-commute. And so a unit on the grid, if you like, these distances here are chosen such that uh, the product of the displacements for these two or the two amplitudes would produce me a, a odd multiple of pi and so I can construct then two displacements, one along position uh, and one along momentum, if you like, uh, which then anti-commute with each other and form my logical operators. Uh, on top of that, then if I double these distances, then essentially the area I get doubles, yeah, because, uh, or doubles if I try and commute SX with ZL, right, that would be twice the area. Then I satisfy a multiple of two pi, and then I get operators which commute with the logical operators and they commute with each other because you get four times the area. Yeah. So somehow this is the beautiful design of the code is that these operators satisfy the required uh, commutation relations for error checks, which you commute with all your logical uh, operators, but should also be able to extract some error information. 
So um, what do code words uh, look like? So I should remind you that these should be invariant under any of the stabilizer uh, operators, right? Uh, and so what we uh, see and what you probably know is that these, if I wrote them in position space, uh, I should expect periodic arrays, if you like, of uh, peaks, which should be infinitely narrow in the perfect uh, GKP state, which are separated by two times root pi, which is one of these, uh, it's a sort of symmetric uh, distance that you'd like to choose. And errors in this code, then the types of errors that it's made to correct are, uh, sorry, so I should just say the one state is displaced from that by half this unit, right? So again, is a periodic array of peaks. So errors basically look like uh, some sort of uh, shifts in position, and these are the correctable errors. And uh, of course, I take a slightly uh, heuristic view, but you can imagine this is due to diffusion and this retains this Gaussian distribution. Uh, and then to get a logical error, what you're trying to protect against is that you get overlap between these distributions that appear. Yeah? So you'd like to correct fast enough that you get minimal overlap. And so what you'd like to do in correction is somehow detect how far has this state uh, gone away from the grid uh, and push it back such that you can narrow these Gaussians, right? So somehow the concept of this cooling is, can I narrow Gaussians uh, in phase space? And this has to happen both in the position domain and in the Fourier transform domain, which is uh, momentum. So the basic feature then is sharpen these quadratures, right? Sharpen these Gaussian distributions. Okay, so let me go back to um, the fact that all of these operators that we're trying to deal with are displacement operators, and we have to then have a way of measuring displacement operators. Uh, so this is a very standard circuit for a sort of phase estimation of some operator on a code. You would see this in stabilizer measurements of cubic codes, if you like. Uh, and what I've put in here is a displacement, which might be the uh, stabilizer operator or the logical operator, if you like. Uh, for my GKP code. And I imagine that this top line is the oscillator and this is some ancilla spin system, which is gonna be our internal states of our atom. And for us, this is uh, implemented, this block here, including the Hadamards can also all be implemented in a simple manner, as mentioned before, by driving the oscillator with two laser frequencies tuned both to the red sideband, so the lower sideband and to the upper sideband. And that one, what that does is it sums up a Jane's coming Hamiltonian and an anti Jane's coming Hamiltonian, and that gives you this conditional displacement that you'll have seen yesterday. So just see here that this is basically a displacement or exponentiated, this would be a displacement operator, but here it's conditional on the internal state of the atom, uh, which is the uh, spin state of this ancilla. Yeah. So I can replace then this uh, block in dashed lines with an operator which just looks like the exponential of this Hamiltonian exponentiated for a certain amount of time. And the certain amount of time and the strength tells me about what the value of alpha is here. So we can think from the perspective of the spin, what happens if we perform this sort of coupling to an oscillator? And let's just imagine we've got a position eigenstate, right? So if we have a position eigenstate, this is just going to be a rotation of the spin state about the x-axis, right? So on the block sphere, you can imagine that you're, if you started in the plus z state, you would just rotate about this x-axis. Uh, and then what you can do is you can measure the spin, right? And what's that going to do? It's going to take this block vector and project it on one of the axes, depending on the uh, axis of measurement that you choose, right? So if I measure in the z basis, I should get the cosine of this angle. Uh, and if I measure in the y basis, I should get the, the sine of this angle. And uh, these are the cosine then of this operator and the expectation value is taken over the emotional state, the input emotional state that I have, yeah. So by choosing the measurement basis, then I can put, pick out these two different uh, periodic functions, if you like, of this uh, um, uh, displacement or put another way, it's either the real part, that's the cosine or the imaginary part of the displacement operator. Yeah. Okay, so, um, is there a complication to that? Well, yes, because, uh, so I didn't make it explicit here, but this sort of diagram is a diagram of a pure spin system, right? Being rotated by its, um, uh, in, in its spin space. But what that assumes is that I have position eigenstates, which are actually infinitely, uh, have infinite extent in the momentum basis, right? Uh, and of course, that's never something I can have. And just notice that this displacement actually makes displacements along the momentum axis, right? So uh, what we have to consider then is the states that we actually apply this to and the effect of having finite states and finite states in momentum 
space. And so for us, this is the GKP states, right? So they have this nice uh, periodic uh, structure. These are the spikes that you saw before. But because we have finite energy states, we also have this Gaussian envelope, which constrains essentially uh, how strong the higher energy states are of, the, of these peaks, right? So it makes these uh, higher energy peaks uh, lower in amplitude. And so you see that in, in 3D, uh, this is a Wigner function of states that we made. So we did this by characteristic function reconstruction and then Fourier transformed it. Actually, this state is made from three, a superposition of three squeeze states. Yeah, And this is the Wigner function that you see. And you see this finite extent is both in the position axis and also in the momentum axis, right? That's the Fourier transform relation between the two. Uh, and the width of the peak somehow in, in one quadrature Fourier transform become the width of the envelope in the other quadrant. So this is kind of nice. The, the peaks here are squeezed in our experiment by several dB uh, in both dimensions at some sense. So it's nice for sensing in that sense. That's probably a future area we will explore. But this finiteness causes a problem for the rotation because what it means is that we don't anymore get a nice rotation of our qubit, but we rather get entanglement between the displacement we've put in on the, on the momentum space uh, and the uh, and the spin. So we don't get full contrast on the, on the measurement. Yeah? So in our case for GKP states, right, this is a measurement. Now I'm plotting the GKP state as a function of momentum. And in a measurement of position, yeah, then what I do is I separate two copies of the states uh, and uh, I pull them apart in the momentum space. And what you see is that then they don't overlap perfectly. Yeah? So we'd seen this in our initial experiments with GKP states, and you actually see it here. So this is a, a measurement of position, if you like. So we're gradually increasing the amplitude. Uh, and what you see here is that as these states fail to overlap, that's the initial shift, if you like, as they get out of phase with each other, then you get a drop in contrast. But then the peaks start to overlap again, and you get a rise in contrast. And that's the value you're trying to read out. So one of those is the logical value. And at twice that displacement, it's the stabilizer value. So, but what you also see is that the finite element envelope kills you at some level, right? So what you see is on top of this, the red curve is actually theory, perfect theory, but with the finite envelope, you see that we're losing contrast on our measurement uh, because of using finite states, right? And this was limiting our readout. In fact, our stabilizers here, we could only read out at a 50% level uh, because of this finite envelope, right? That was apparent in our experiment. And that's also experiment, uh, apparent in the Yale experiment at a very similar level, actually, uh, where they, of course, performed the extra step of doing error correction, but still they used uh, finite envelopes. And so they had to put in a more complicated error correction sequence. So the first thing I want to tell you about is how we now correct for this finite envelope. And the intuition is, I hope, rather simple. Uh, here we applied a, a state-dependent displacement that was equal in amplitude and took any one of these peaks in both directions uh, simultaneously. So the plus x would go in one direction, the minus x would go in the other direction. So what we instead do now is we introduce a prior rotation, which is a rotation about the other axis of the spin, which now depends on this momentum position. And what does that do? It means that uh, the superposition associate in the X basis that I'm going to apply my measurement is now biased depending on the position uh, in momentum space, right? And what that means is we can, uh, this rotation means that if you have a lot of positive momentum, your peak has now got a higher amplitude to go left than it has to go right, yeah? And what does that do? It means that these two copies that here were separated from each other maintain the envelope shape and have a very good overlap now between the two, yeah? And what does that mean? It means that the overlap now doesn't contribute to any loss of contrast in the readout, or at least it, it does to some extent. You see these envelopes aren't quite the same, but they, you mitigate the extent of this envelope overlap. Uh, so do we see that? Uh, here's the theory that you would expect. So this is the theory, and it's quite uh, sort of powerful in, in a sense for the squeeze states that we make. If we would, with no envelope correction, we would get about a 90% readout. But we can, could, in principle, get up to 99.9% .9 readout if we applied this correction step. Yeah? And if we could get to higher squeezing values, less finite states, this actually rapidly goes to one. So this is extremely powerful. Yeah? In our actual experiment, we make the states with roughly a 90% infidelity due to other types of measurement error. 
but we do see that the optimal value is exactly that predicted from the theory. Yeah? So this improves us in our case from about 82% readout to 90% readout of these uh, logical states. And uh, for the stabilizer, actually, that's even a little better. Uh, so in our stabilizer measurement with no correction for the envelope, we get a 50% stabilizer readout. And now correcting for the envelope, even in the experiment, we get a 75% readout and we should be able to get above 90% uh, if we had ideal states. Yeah. So this correction of the envelope is a powerful step, and I think it uh, maybe helps even with some of the things that Barbara was talking about uh, in the previous talk. So let me then tell you about how we do error correction. So uh, here we're very much following the scheme of the Yale group, so I just will uh, describe that in a little bit of detail. So the basic notion here is that when we measure the spin, what we're doing is we we make a conditional measurement. There's an outcome of the spin, which now has got some conditional probability on the position of the oscillator. And for the two different spin states, in this case, this is given by a sign of the uh, displacement. Yeah, uh, and uh, the two different spin states are out of phase in that sign. So if we have an initial Gaussian distribution of our state, then we can think about the if we conditional on measuring plus y then we have a, a Bayesian update, if you like, of the probability distribution of the underlying state, right? So what happens to this Gaussian is it, uh, if I detect plus y, I should modify my new distribution uh, as by this conditional probability by Bayes rule, right? Multiplied by the original probability density. So what do I get for the plus y? I then see that for some settings, I get a shifted Gaussian, and for minus y, I get a shifted Gaussian again in the opposite direction, yeah? And so you see then that the a correction here should be to shift back this Gaussian uh, to the center and also shift this Gaussian back to the center. And I do that conditional on the outcomes of these measurements. Right? So what do I do? I shove them back to the center. And then what you see is that the new Gaussian is a narrowed version of the original one, right? And that's the narrowing that we're trying to achieve in the error correction. Yeah. So indeed, that was what was done in the Yale experiment, right? So they did this by doing a conditional displacement for the measurement and doing the feedback based on the measurement outcome, if you like. And the problem they ran into was this finite envelope problem, right? So what they had to do was take the Gaussian of the individual peaks and sharpen those. And then they had to counter the Gaussian of the envelope increasing by putting in these trimming steps that kept the state finite, yeah? So, um, where we came into this uh, looking at that again was to think, could our new measurement method also allow us to get rid of this trimming step? Yeah. Uh, but on top of that, we had to do one other thing because we work with trapped ions. Yeah. So um, if we were to do what the Yale guys did, then we would have a problem with our measurement because in half the cases when we measure, the ion fluoresces. And when the ion fluoresces, we scatter around 3,000 photons before we get another, enough information to make a positive uh, recognition. Yeah? And so that would totally wreck our oscillator state because every photon creates recoil of our atom. Yeah? So um, what can we do about that? Uh, so that was meant to show these are the bright states. So what we did in the original experiments is actually is we post-selected on dark states when we needed to do measurements. Right? Dark states, there's no scattering. We don't have to worry about this. What we do in the error correction instead is we put in a coherent feedback step. So that's again, just a conditional displacement by the requisite amount. And then we repump the iron. And repumping the iron, uh, we can do with about two photons, actually I've got that slightly wrong, of, of recoil. And that's dramatically reduced versus 3000. Uh, there is a bit of displacement from that, right? But in the GKP code, that's a correctable error. So that's something that we can cope with as long as it's small enough. Okay, so these are the ingredients for our uh, dissipation-based uh, error correction. So we apply basically one of these modified readouts. This is the main readout pulse. This is the thing that corrects for the finite envelope. And then in our correction, we apply again a conditional uh, displacement that does the correction, followed by a spin reset. And we do that for both the position, and then we follow it up by doing it for the momentum. So it's just a dissipative map, essentially, that keeps pumping. It's just like laser cooling at some level. So how do we choose the settings for this? Uh, well, what we find is that we, what we want to do is choose epsilon and mu, which are kind of the finite envelope and correction settings. And what we do is just take a single cycle of this on a perfect state, and we ask, can we maximize the fidelity that we get? So what's that telling us? It's telling us that this cycle should do as little damage to the, a perfect state that doesn't need correction as possible. 
And so what we see there again is that uh, somehow we can put in the correction value that we use and scan it with epsilon equal to zero, and we would find we get about a 95% correction. And that's why Yale needed to do trimming. Uh, but with the corrected uh, system, we can get up to now over 99% uh, before we, uh, in, in a single uh, block of this, that's the infidelity due to our correction cycle. So how well does it work, right? So here's, we start with a ground state of the atom and we just start applying this dissipation sequence and then we measure stabilizers. So we measure these finite stabilizers and you see that we converge within about six cycles uh, to a steady state of about 80% stabilizer readout. On top of that, we can then stop and say, now we've prepared uh, the subspace, how does the stabilizer evolve? And we can do that without stabilization. And there we see rapid decay in less than a millisecond. Uh, but if we are stabilizing, you see that our stabilizer values are completely stable, uh, basically up to hundreds of rounds of uh, error correction. Yeah. That's the stabilizer values. Now inside the subspace are logical states, right? Uh, and so we've prepared both square and hexagonal logical states. So here are the, we correct on the displacements in X and Z essentially for the square GKP code. Uh, and here are the logical readouts that we do as a function of number of cycles at the top and as a function of time at the bottom. So here in the dashed lines and these curves here, you see the uncorrected, which have coherence times on the level of uh, two or so milliseconds. Uh, and when we do the correction, we see that we get out to 12, eight and, uh, and 12 milliseconds. So we have a factor of more than three extension of the logical coherence uh, of this GKP qubit. We've done that also for the hexagonal code in part inspired by the fact that for Yale, I mean, we do see some feature, which is that the Y, uh, which is the green here decays faster. And that's because of uh, one interpretation of that is this asymmetry, it's further out from the origin. Uh, and makes it more susceptible to errors, which in our case are actually more dephasing errors than photon loss or uh, phonon loss, yeah. Uh, so one idea there is to symmetrize that, and we thought that would help, yeah. Uh, in fact, what we find is uh, it, it doesn't particularly help, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what we find uh, is with no stabilization sync, it's a bit, little bit worse, yeah, and also stabilized, uh, it's worse, yeah. So we're still diagnosing why that is. That'll be peculiar to our error model. It might be errors that we also introduce in the correction. One thing to say, and we've been discussing a little bit with uh, people at Yale about this, is that we are only correcting for X and Z at the moment, and they uh, were correcting for all three. We did try correcting for all three stabilizers, but we so far didn't see any improvement from them. So what's limiting us and what is sort of the difference between maybe us and the superconducting qubit uh, or superconducting resonator implementation of this? So we think primarily we're, we're limited at the moment by uh, oscillator dephasing. Yeah, so we have essentially the iron is in a trap and there are voltages that supply that trap potential and these fluctuate with time. Yeah, so one of them would be the line cycle. We think we can cancel that quite readily, but we actually, I think, think we're limited more by a Markovian frequency component that I'm not sure we understand where that comes from. Yeah. Uh, the heating of the iron, so our electrodes are also at high temperature, they're at room temperature, right? And that produces heating of the iron of about 10 quanta per second. And so that's also something we should counter. But at the moment, uh, these are sort of these green plots are all the individual components. Uh, and we think that that's not uh, limiting us. But there are other things that can limit us. Uh, Rabi frequency fluctuations in the control parameters can produce uncertain displacements. And spin dephasing could propagate onto the code, though we think it's not limiting at us at the moment. So I just wanted to come to a final topic, which is uh, I, I mentioned that this feels like laser cooling. Uh, and in fact, this method of correction just narrows a Gaussian. And if you think about a, a thermal state of an oscillator, it's a Gaussian distribution, right? So actually what you're doing when you're narrowing a Gaussian peak for a GKP error correction is somehow analogous to just doing laser cooling. Yeah, and that inspired us to look at actually whether this same method could be used for uh, laser cooling, right? Uh, so what, what do you have in laser cooling? You have a situation where the width of the Gaussian is somehow given by the N bar of your, or, or your occupation of your oscillator, right? So what we found was that uh, here, what we have, if we've got a large N bar, uh, is that we can choose optimal parameters for both the measurement and the correction. Uh, and what we find for a large N bar is that our measurement should now, it's not the GKP distance of root two, uh, two root pi, right? It's now some small distance if N bar is large and the correction is then quite a large displacement, but the same basic physics applies, yeah. 
And it's quite an interesting type of laser cooling because every time you pump the spin uh, and you do this first for position and then you do it for momentum, so you pump the spin two times, then you actually reduce the occupation of your oscillator by a factor of 0.6. And that's quite remarkable. So when we apply sideband cooling, which is quite similar to this, uh, we take out on a single repump, we take out one quanta. So if we started from 100 quanta, we go to 99, we go to 98, we go to 97. Yeah. Uh, here in two repumps, essentially of the spin, we'd go to uh, straight from 100 to 60. Yeah. So that there's some sort of quite powerful notion in here, and it makes you wonder how many repumps do you really have to do to reduce the energy of an oscillator, right? That's somehow a, a fundamental question related to sort of uh, Landau type principle arguments, right? So first thing to say is it works. We've done it in the lab. This is actually starting from not 100. We've got a few nonlinearities that causes problems coming from 100 and we're trying to understand them better. But this exponential suppression, this is the blue dots and, and somehow the 0.632 to the power something is the green dashed line. And you see that we get a pretty good exponential suppression. So what's the limit to efficiency? So you can think to yourself that spin reset removes basically KB log two of entropy, right? Uh, so if you look at that in the context of a thermal distribution of an oscillator, that's approximately KB just log of n bar, at least for n bar greater than, much greater than one. Then you can see that after a single repump, you should have removed this amount of entropy. So you should be able to take n bar down to n bar over two. Yeah. So on a single repump, you should be able to take a factor of a half. With two repumps, you should get down to a value of a quarter. Yeah. And we we get a factor of 0.6, so we're 2.5 or so above what's a very fundamental limit actually for uh, uh, extraction of entropy from a system. Right? So we actually think we now know the unitary for uh, getting to this uh, limit and we're sort of interested to see if we can do that in the lab. So in summary then I've told you uh, about our recent experiments where we've been able to uh, extend logical coherence by a factor of more than three for a GKP code using uh, autonomous dissipation. We've measured and introduced these finite code corrected oscillate operators, right, which I think is a useful step for increasing the fidelity of GKP uh, readout. I should just say that theory work has gone in parallel with what we've been doing here. So Baptist Royer, I think, told us uh, yesterday about very a sort of different construction, but the same basic notion of doing the autonomous GKP uh, error correction. And actually, Jakob Pastrop in Ulrich Anderson's group uh, sort of simultaneously also came up with ideas for doing these finite code corrected uh, states. Another thing that's in this paper that I'm, uh, of course, inviting you to read here is actually that we've, uh, we're preparing GKP states by a couple of new methods and uh, some of them which are just coherent, starting from the ground state or starting from squeeze states, and some of them involving projection uh, due to this sort of autonomous type dissipation. So uh, if you're interested in that, then feel free to check it out. Uh, and I find it an interesting connection to see that actually this is uh, these ideas that are coming from GKP are, are connected to how you, how fundamentally can you extract entropy from an oscillator and actually already it's not too bad yeah uh, even though I'm sure there are improvements to be had yeah so for me that's an intriguing connection. So uh, with that, then I uh, thank you, but I also should thank the main people who uh, were involved in the work that I've spoken about today. And uh, I think primarily that was um, San Long Huen uh, and Brennan Deneve, uh, who I think are featured uh, here and here, and also Tanya Berle, who works very actively on that setup and her focus is another experiment, but she certainly contributed strongly to this one. So with that, thanks for your attention. And I hope there are some questions uh, about any aspect of the talk. That's great. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was, uh, that's, that's quite impressive. Um, so we are, you, you were significantly early. So we've oh, got, yeah. uh, we've got a good, no, that's great. Thank you. We've got yeah, a good, I, um, I mean, you can have another six minutes if you want it. But, oh, well, I should uh, have put all the stuff we, about the preparation in. Yeah, no, I, I thought I was going to be a bit over actually. You, well, you want to talk about it? You can. I, don't, I think I don't have slides, yeah, but please ask questions. Okay. That's probably all right. Well, we can ask questions stuff. about it. Yeah. Um, all right. So thank you very much. And uh, let's see here. So we've got plenty of time for questions. So one question is, and as always, please type it in the chat. Uh, so we have a question uh, from, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Philippe. Uh, Hi, Jonathan. That's awesome. Awesome. Could you recall the spin dephasing time? I'm curious as to which point it will limit your correction. Yeah. So. Um, I'm curious too. We at the moment, so yeah, okay. The coherence time in our setup is roughly uh, two milliseconds, 
Okay, and I didn't say it, but a correction cycle, uh, I think is taking, uh, let me get this right, uh, on the level of 150 microseconds. Now, watch out for my coherence time that I'm quoting. This is not really one over E type decay that we have in our setup, right? So we have slow fluctuations on primarily on the laser, which limit our um, coherence time. And so this is a Gaussian type decay. So you would have to take that into account. In the short time limit, that's quite favorable versus exponential decay, yeah. Uh, so what we see in the modeling of the um, uh, errors, at least, is that, well, maybe you see it here in a certain sense. So, uh, well, no, you don't, because I haven't included the right part. OK, but let me just say it, that we so far have been primarily modeling the oscillator errors that we see. Uh, and we see that we get fairly good consistency, both with the, we have a model that tells us about the 0 plus 1 Fox state superposition. Uh, and we see funny wiggles in that because of our 50 hertz, for instance. Uh, and then we put that sort of model into our GKP and we see fairly good agreement between the theory and the experiment. Yeah? So we think we're not being too affected by other factors. Yeah? Albeit that one thing that's a bit strange is this Markovian element to the dephasing because uh, there's not an obvious mechanism for that. There may be some intermediate fast time scale noise that's contributing to that, but that's the thing that we probably least understand. And maybe it's even that we introduce it due to uh, noise that's in our ancillas, but I we I think we put that into the simulations and we haven't seen that it accounts for it yet. Yeah. Though, you know, the, the thing we can't quite account for at the moment is the, that the hexagonal doesn't do at least as well as the square code. So that's something that we're a bit again, is a bit uncertain. But somehow there's a lot of factors that come into these experiments, right, that you then have to untangle over time. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So we have a couple more questions coming in. Uh, let's see, here's one from Ben. Uh, Jonathan, great talk. I'm curious what you're looking forward to technologically for emotional state GKP and ions. Is there a reason to prefer these qubits to internal state qubits, which have shown exceedingly long coherence times? perhaps for non-computing uses? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think like I've become more and more favorable towards them and I don't think it's an irrational favor. So let me just say a few things. So uh, ion internal states true have a wonderful coherence times. You can, I mean, people have with a bit of dynamical decoupling demonstrated, I think uh, consistent with a year decoherence times, right? But you know what you find when you start doing quantum computing is you're not limited by it's not the coherence. At that point, the coherence time doesn't matter, right? What limits you is your gates. And you have to do stuff to your qubits in quantum computing. Yeah. So uh, the I think the interesting aspect of the GKP, of course, it doesn't work that well yet, right? Is that somehow you have the idea that you might be able to do correctable gates directly on your physical systems. Uh, and so I do think that there's quite a interesting aspect there. Uh, I haven't explored that in huge depth, but you know, a lot of the gates are displacements. Uh, and, you know, when we make errors on displacements, I would say they primarily are slightly a wrong angle uh, of displacement or a wrong displacement amplitude. And that is a correctable error in the GKP code. So in a certain sense, that seems like it's kind of nice. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I'd say there is that, you know, I mean, I'm going to border on uh, some sort of uh, yeah, probably this is very badly said, right? But some of my feeling about these GKP codes is that they're very physical, right? Somehow because they're local and they deal with the local errors that you have, you feel like, uh, I know what I'm doing. I'm just correcting this physical system, yeah? Uh, and I do feel like with the uh, sort of multi-qubit code type uh, approaches, that one of the things you always worry about is a little bit of crosstalk from here to there, creating correlations and things like that. And there are probably schemes to mitigate this. But I do wonder whether having an array of locally corrected systems also probably um, at some level diffuses correlations that are coming on the larger system level. Yeah. So I think it could be interesting to embed these uh, systems. I, I don't quite know how to do it yet. Uh, so we're trying to think about it, but I think it's intriguing. Yeah. On the other hand, I think these GKP states are somehow interesting in another right, right? They are somehow um, below, uh, they've got squeezing in both quadratures at least, uh, so you should be able to measure accurately small displacements and uh, we certainly will return to that at some point, yeah. Um, I think the last point to make is that it's not 
we haven't quite got a scheme yet for doing other bosonic codes like the cat codes. Yeah, there's various aspects that I, uh, you know, one of the things that's nice in the cat codes is to be able to do these parity readouts and parity type dispersive control. For us, that's not all that obvious that that's really a, a good thing to be doing. Yeah, it's a, it's a weaker effect, yeah. So somehow then I look at Philippe's experiment and I say we should be inspired by the fact that uh, in superconducting cavities, you came from a dispersive interaction and you create the conditional displacement and somehow our natural tool is the conditional displacement. Can we think of a fancy trick to go back and, and, and make that work well? But that's something for the future, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's one more question here from Julia. Julia Ferrini, she, uh, she says, awesome talk. Does it make sense to talk about break even in trapped ions at this point? Yeah, so um, our, so what would it be our sort of oscillator break even, right? At the moment, what we see on a zero plus one Fox state superposition uh, is that we have about a 16 millisecond coherence time. Yeah, so you can see that's longer than the stabilized GKP. Uh, and with the dephasing that we have, we basically, I think we also slightly hurt ourselves. With the amount of noise we have at the moment, we have to basically apply GKP just as fast as possible, yeah? Uh, and GKP itself does a little bit of damage, right? I said 99 point something for the fidelity of preservation, but there's also the recoil you have to consider. So there is a bit of damage that we're doing, yeah? So if we could only get to slightly lower noise levels, I think we could also somewhat uh, relax. We could start to balance or play with the rate at which we apply error correction, which in these sort of, um, yeah, it's also true of the qubit trap ion systems that you don't just want to apply error correction as fast as possible generally, because your gates are partly what limit you somehow. Yeah, uh, and so it does, you can get to break even regimes, but part of it is choosing the rate at which you apply error correction somehow, yeah. Uh, and so I think break even is a, I find it a very sort of, it's not a perfectly defined uh, goal in any setting to some regard. I think we saw that last night, uh, that's some element. Uh, there are some nice notions of it. I, I'm in this IARPA program for logical qubits. And of course, people talk a lot about how to measure it really uh, and how to talk about it. But um, yeah, maybe we can get to some comparison with the zero plus one Fox state. That would, would of course be nice. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Great, um, I have a question. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm curious about this envelope correction. Mm -hmm. So um, you applied a different conditional displacement before doing the one that you wanted. Is that is that the right? Yeah, understanding? that's basically right. Maybe I can just so, just go through it again if that's useful. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and if there's if there's a um, is there a way to look at this in phase space? Have you considered that? And well, if not, I mean, maybe we can just have a look at what you said. Yeah. So let me just pan it out. In a certain sense, this is a cut through phase space, or it's I've integrated out the phase space into momentum, right? Uh, and the, I think the important thing is that the, um, so what you're trying to do is measure position, which is one axis of the state. But in order to do that, you have to displace in the other direction because ultimately what you're going to pick up is the geometric phase factor, yeah, from the commutation. You've got some displace, your state has been displaced a little bit in position and now you're going to pull it apart and see, can I see the geometric phase factor coming from that extra displacement, yeah? And so right. you have to pull the state apart. And I think that's the uh, sort of, that's the first element. That's really where the loss of overlap comes from. So what is this guy doing, right? It's actually pulling your state apart in the, if you like, if, you, if you've got these squeezed peaks, uh, it's also pulling your state apart a little bit in the squeezed direction, yeah? In the other quadrature, yeah? So it's doing a bit of damage, right? We do have to deal with the fact that it does a little bit of damage. But fortunately, what it does is it, it unbiases this, it biases the superposition for each individual peak faster than it seems to do damage in terms of removing the overlap in the other quadrature, yeah? Uh, and so what it does, the primary thing that it then does is create these rotated superpositions depending on the position in P. And that's the really nice thing for us because it allows us then to correct the envelope essentially, yeah? Uh, and all it does is, yeah, essentially you see the middle one is unbiased, right? Uh, it goes equally in either direction, but the higher P ones, they always get a higher weight towards the origin, which keeps the state maintained at the origin, essentially, yeah. Um, I see. Well, I mean, it looks like the details are here. So I'll, I'm, I'm really curious about how- Yeah, have a look at it, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's really I should neat. say, I mean, you know, Baptiste, 
Baptiste has the same basic notion. Well, both uh, Jacob has it, I think, done more like we did it, Jacob Pastrop. Um, Baptiste, of course, he comes up with finite stabilizers from a bit of a different construction, right? But actually, in a certain sense, what he does is a little bit more rigorous. He comes up with the exact uh, finite stabilizers, uh, and then he approximates them, right? So he already knows what the exact ones are. In my case, I'm more from an experimental angle. I'm just trying to fix this problem, right? And so I've only, I come up with, in a sense, approximations to these finite stabilizers directly by this argument. Uh, and what he does is more from a formal construction of uh, an energy constraint on the, on the state. Yeah. Right, right. Well, fantastic. So that is, uh, that's right on time. So I Great. think we should uh, thank thank all the speakers, um, uh, Akira, Barbara, and Jonathan. Uh, thank you for a fantastic session. And uh, I will now turn it back. Oh, of course, further questions on Slack for all presenters, okay. and I'll turn it back over to the organizers. Uh, thanks, Nick, and uh, uh, thanks for sharing the session as well. Um, no worries. So the very last session of the workshop is in six hours. So I hope some of you that are in the right time zone will come for that. Um, yeah, thanks again. That was an awesome session. See you later. Jonathan, are you there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I know I kind of put you on the spot with that question because it's been something I've, I've wondered about, given the fact that internal states of ions are already such good qubits. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of neat engineering that mm -hmm. goes into, you know, designing these crazy emotional states. But I think you're right that there's also um, potential, you know, practical advantages for computing or even just the sensing aspects mm -hmm. as you were saying um but i would yeah i was curious what you what you're planning to do with it yeah i mean i think I the next yeah there's two things i'm thinking about at the moment like i i of course we would like to improve the performance i think we'd quite like to look at some other codes as well because we feel like that could be uh, relevant but the um i think like thinking how to do it's the same problem in superconducting circuits to some degree right how to do a good two qubit gate on these things it's not the you've got this combination of having to have this uh, two mode squeezing and the beam splitter, right? Which is not your average Hamiltonian that appears in the mm -hmm. lab because you have energy conservation. Uh, so you tend to get the rotating frame version of these things and you have to then figure out how to parametrically drive it correctly to get naturally the uh, Hamiltonian you want for the, um, for the interaction for these, you know, XX type, uh, E to the XX type gates, yeah. So that is something that I, I don't at the moment know how to do it. I haven't spent a huge amount of time thinking about it, but uh, that's certainly like one of the open questions I think that I would be entertained to see if we could uh, get to. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, th th this was a great session. I appreciate you. Talk no, I mean, these are, somehow it's a nice conference. People are talking very well. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Hi. Don't hi. you think that uh, like, um, if you have two uh, oscillators coupled to the same spin, you could mediate like uh, a parametrically activated uh, uh, two-way yes. squeezing? So, and, uh, yeah. yeah, so I think Krista has this actually in our original paper in the appendix, yeah. So I think I don't, I, I'm not terribly attracted by that because I would like to think about something that somehow you can think you can scale. Uh, so what I'm always trying to think about is how to have two ions uh, in a trap next to each other with local oscillators, uh, but yeah. where you can tune them in and out of resonance for the interaction. Yeah. And there, the natural interaction between those two is a beam splitter. But I agree with you that possibly there's a couple of tricks we could use, right? There are other modes of oscillation, which are collective modes of oscillation of these ions. Uh, so there's games we could play with those. And there's also two pairs of spin states. So as you say, we could potentially uh, drive the spins at some level to create some. Uh, um, but, but, but this beam splitter you are talking about is uh, in the lab frame, right? It's not in the rotating frame, no? or is it? Uh... 
the what's in the lab frame? Sorry? This uh, beam splitter interaction uh, you are talking about is the yeah. The beam splitter right? is in the lab frame, right? So then the question is, uh, but you know, the the basic underlying interaction that's there is really the x one x two. It's just that uh, once you take the rotating wave approximation, you get uh, the beam yeah. splitter, right? So the question then is whether you can parametrically con connect somehow the right operators together. And I, I guess it's possible. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just thinking about ones, you know, that I don't know if you, you guys probably have the same problem, right? But when I start to drive oscillating tones into my system, other stuff starts to happen is my guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I drive other things I didn't want to drive. Yeah. And, and of course, resonance is quite good at that. So I hope not, but uh, that's where I just would like to be a little bit clean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. You're right. I mean, you're, you're right. Uh, I mean, all the terms are, are there. You just, but you need to drive them. That's uh, that's sure, for sure. Like, uh, or you need to use some also, Raman process to enhance them. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. That's. Uh, yeah. I mean, the other thing that you could potentially do is come up with some fancy sequence for somehow swapping different terms. You know, like some sort of. That's the other way to modulate, right? Uh, and. Uh, Again, that's, yeah, it probably just takes a student project to figure these things out, but I haven't done it yet. But, so, yeah. And I think that's, a, that's a, a path that the Yale people are exploring also, uh, like uh, mm -hmm. to do uh, rather than uh, continuous parametric bumping to uh, trotterize this, if you want, with uh, sequences of uh, conditional displacements and so on. Yeah, indeed. And like, you know, we, we've done sideband cooling for years, right? Uh, and uh, uh, that's what we do, right? You can either do it continuously, <laughs> Uh, and we do it with the squeeze state pumping. We either turn it on continuously or we go to a pulsed mode. And it's just much easier to work with the pulsed mode ultimately, yeah? because the, the pumping thing has some other effect. It produces stark shifts on the qubit, right? And then you have to deal with stabilizing that field, which you don't care about really, right? So what we do is we just decouple the two and bingo, away we go, and it's easy, yeah. <laughs> That's true, but uh, in particular, when you apply uh, simultaneously to mode squeezing and uh, and beam splitter, you can have uh, over, over spurious terms, like uh, Yeah, absolutely, yeah, no, no. I, <laughs> That's what I'm scared of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the next step, like a good uh, quadrature, quadrature uh, tunable interaction, I guess, is uh, one of the next uh, frontiers for uh, GKP cube. It's like, uh, anyway, it will be necessary for gates. So, yeah. I think so, right? Like it's it's a next, yeah, clear next step. Yeah. 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 Cool, that was great. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for, of course, this came out of those discussions in December, so this was uh, also fun. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I must say our protocol came from your seminar uh, at Yale also. When yeah, you yeah, no, so it's great, uh, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the idea of doing autonomous feedback, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Good. Well, bye, everyone. I think. Uh, should I be? I should be in a Slack channel, right? Well. Thanks for the, the the conference. Is great, by the way. To.